Okay, I hope you had a short refreshment. And my apologies um, that our first sessions went over time. Um, I will be an even stricter timekeeper for this panel, so I'm sorry that uh, you have to uh, kind of, um, yeah, make up for the time lost, but not completely. So we want to listen to your remarks, and we also want to have a little bit of time of debate left afterwards. The first input comes from Celia Dean Drummond. She's the director of the Laudato Si Research Institute at the University of Oxford. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, it's a real honor to be invited to speak at this um, esteemed conference and thank you to all of you who've come this afternoon uh, to uh, finish listening to some of the other aspects of the technolo technological transition. Um, and um, I'm going to start off by thinking about what, where Pope Francis comes from, as to set the scene, as it were, because although this is technically about the science, I think it's important to, to see the science through an integral ecology lens. So it's well known that Pope Francis critiqued what he called the technological paradigm, and it could be argued that integral ecology mirrors that paradigm, that is, in terms of its epistemic principles. In other words, it's, a, it's in contradistinction to a technological mindset. But that doesn't mean that Pope Francis is opposed to science and technology, and I think this is quite an important point to make, but, but opposed to their substitution for moral and theological ways of framing our human relationships and priorities. And at, Importantly for him and for, for us at this conference, once a distorted form of anthropocentrism takes hold, life becomes one-dimensional, where an individual subject seeks to control and manipulate the world. So he refuses then that, um, to accept that the products of tech our technology are morally neut neutral. I'm going to um, mention Aristotle again. It's come, Aristotle's already come up in terms of principles, but I think it's interesting to reflect, again, in the light of Aristotle, what Pope Francis is doing. In an Aristotelian view, the products of our making, or poesis, doesn't necessarily constitute a moral act, even if a decision about whether to engage in that technology may be moral, that is aligned with praxis. But Pope Francis, on the other hand, refuses to attribute neutrality to the products of our technology. To quote Laudato C, for they create a framework which ends up conditioning lifestyles and shaping social possibilities along the lines dictated by the interests of, a certain, of certain powerful groups. So just re reinforcing really what we've already heard in the earlier section. So what he's after, therefore, is not so much a dismissal of science and new technologies, but using these tools at the service of a different vision of progress, which is, quote, healthier, more social, more human, and more integral. So it might seem rather like an oxymoron, then, to suggest that any biotechnology could be part of an integral ecology approach. But the priority for Pope Francis is for any technology to be at the service of humanity, quote, truly helping them to live with more dignity and less suffering. And that's 112 in Laudato Si. So good intentions are also not always sufficient, as the checkered history of science and technology shows only too well. What I'm going to do next is to, is to start really from my own experience as a plant physiologist. I didn't work as a genetically, genetic engineer 
um, at this stage of my history. But the laboratory next door to me, the, uh, the, the scientists in the laboratory next door to me did. And it was presupposed that this was the most sophisticated kind of botany you could do. And it was in the stages in the 80s where these tech tools and technologies hadn't been developed. It was very new. It was pushed forward by the Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher as being the new wave of what, what, where botany should go next and, and so on and so forth. I resisted the, to press, the pressure to join those ranks. And in my experience as a working plant physiologist, my plant geneticist colleagues believed that genetically modifying crops was just speeding up what might happen anyway through the more tedious processes of plant breeding. That, if you like, was the reason for doing it in the first place. Even translating genes from one species into another was premised on the basis that such transitions are occasionally possible through quote, natural viral infections. So the naturalistic fallacy loomed large in such arguments. But for those scientists, scientists, such an approach was largely an attempt to gain further public confidence. In other words, the arguments were put in for it being natural because they believed that by calling it natural, it would become more acceptable and therefore um, uh, more funding would come in. So what motivated the scientists was the hope of a significant breakthrough in techniques that could perhaps offer a patent which would deliver further resources for further research. So it was a self-perpetuating machine. But what was rather more insidious was the subsequent lack of public labeling of products from genetically modified crops, particularly in the USA. So it's now almost impossible to find non-GMO soya bean, for example and other products as well. The transnational companies were the primary beneficiaries of techniques which, such as that which produces herbicide-resistant soya that withstand herbicides, where the herbicide and the GM seed are self-sterile and sold in a single package, thus making the farmers dependent on that particular um, manipulated seed. I'm now going to do, give a short case study of BT maize. Yields can, nevertheless, go up significantly arising out of these manipulations. So putting out of business subsistence farmers practicing traditional agriculture. The close identity between naturally variegated maize and the local farming communities touched on a deep aspect of their culture, which was in effect eradicated through the techniques of GM maize, known also as BT maize which is resistant to insects and other monocultures. And disguised in such considerations are the way GMOs have been foisted on countries which have had weaker regulatory frameworks, that's thus allowing its spread over the global south, often without proper consultation with, with traditional farming communities. Scientists are not all irresponsible, however. So I don't want to paint the picture that um, all genetically modification is necessarily an evil and therefore we should avoid it. So in 2009, for example, a group of scientists signed a petition objecting to the planting of transgenic maize in Mexico where maize first originated and where many of the naturally occurring var variations are the sources of, of further diversity. So, so planting of that transgenic maize could effectively wipe out that diversity. And governments are often weak in the face of transnational giants. Monsanto and Dow AgriScience received permission from the Mexican government to conduct a transgenic trial. And the journal Nature, one of the most respected science journals um, in the Western world, reported that thousands of scientists rallied to try and prevent such a trial taking place due to the threat to native species. So it wasn't the threat to the people, it was the threat to the species they were worried about. And that report published in 2009, nearly 2,000 scientists have signed a petition to block the experiments because there's no way to stop gene flow to the native crops. Um, and... Uh, that's according to Montgomery Slatekin, who's a geneticist at the University of California, Berkeley. What about an indigenous perspective? Um, 
For the indigenous population, the spread of trans transgenes into the wild species amounts to a form of contamination. The ethical issues are complex. It's not just about what might be possible in technological terms, finding solutions to low yields, for example, as native crop species are also tied up with human identity in complex ways, as I mentioned in the case of, of maize. But what about CRISPR-Cas9, which is one of the latest tools in the armory of genetic uh, modifiers? This has only come on the scene in 2012. It's extremely re uh, recent. It's only 20 years ago. Um, and uh, just uh, CRISPR-Cas9 um, was discovered, and it was just uh, three years after the incident I was talking about in, in 2009. And this new, more accurate tool can be used to, to edit genes from agricultural crops right through to human beings. And it's, it, it's under discussion at the moment for that purpose. CRISPR, for those of you who are maybe curious, stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. And CAS is the associated protein with that um, CRISPR tool, if you will. The basic components are then a Cas nuclease, which is a Cas9, and then a guide RNA or gRNA that are both associate to form a complex. gRNA is one, of one RNA molecule and provides the specificity so that the complex can attach to a genom genomic DNA sequence or the target, matching the variable portion of the gRNA using base pairs of about 20 base pairs. So it's a little bit like a probe. You put the probe at the end of the, into the gRNA and it finds where it, where it needs to, um, to locate itself on the, on the DNA of the, of, the target, of the target. Once attached, the protein Cas9 then cuts both strands of the DNA, leaving a double-stranded break at that site. Cells then naturally repair the breaks after the DNA sequence is changed to the target. And so it repairs it in a different kind of way because you can potentially remove some of the, of the sequences. Sometimes multiple breaks occur, leading to unanticipated effects. So although it's, it's talked about as being a highly accurate tool, in practice it's not quite as accurate as you might think. And almost any target site can be developed using the tool, which is why its introduction has led to so much public debate and discussion. And before that time, GM was very much hit and miss, reliant on much cruder techniques for breaking the DNA. And uh, I've, uh, okay, I've only got two minutes left, so I'm going to run through this very quickly. In, um, um, in the, in the, the USD, USDA has decided that genetic modifications using CRISPR are ri arising introduce, uh, without you introducing pest genes are out the outside the scope of USDA regulation. And I think that's, um, I can give you an example in the questions if you're interested, but I think it's actually quite important to point out that um, this regulation then, or CRISPR-based technology can slip through without any regulation whatsoever because of the way that um, mod those modifications can, can be defined. At the same time, uh, gene editing in domesticated animals to withstand crowded or insanitary conditions is, I would say, necessarily immoral. And human gene editing is also commonplace in embryonic research. Should it be outlawed? Potentially, um, uh, should it be outlawed altogether? I think it would be easy to press for a ban on all gene ed editing, but that might be unrealistic. What might be realistic is a greater awareness of the, pro of the processes with which tools like gene editing need to be managed. And then finally, this is my last slide, the search for practical wisdom. And this is where I think we need to have an ethical conversation. So if we're going to go for an integral ecology debate around GM, we need to include those who are working in philosophy, theology, and some of the other human sciences 
in order to develop what I would call the deliberative process of practical wisdom within particular communities so that we can work out what uh, needs to be done in particular situations. Because it varies depending on the particular um, uh, technology being discussed. And I've uh, took, um, mentioned here the different ingredients of practical wisdom. They cannot rule out, however, all uncertainty of mind. And so therefore, in taking prudential action, there will be more risks than if we just stick to normative rules, such as always ban GM in all circumstances. And I think that while there are dozens of examples um, of the way GM technology has been, has been harmful for human or other life forms, or led to a diminishment in their capacity to flourish, it would be against an integral, and therefore these would be against an integral ecology approach. Scientists need to be encouraged to think about more creatively, about more positive ways in which, in which GM could be genuinely at the service of humanity. And with that, I will think, finish. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for introducing us to this very different field um, of CRISP gene editing. And um, now I would like to welcome Maria Adelaida Farah. She is the Vice President of Extension and Institu Interinstitutional Relations of the Pontifical Javeriana University. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Wait. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, the title of my short intervention today is Power of Technologies in Rural Territories. How, for what, and for whom? Some ideas from gender approach. My intervention today will focus on, in two aspects. The first one is the diversity and interactions in rural communities. And the second one is power relationships and empowerment. In order to illustrate the, these two points, let me please tell you a little bit about two cases from the two rural realities in Colombia. The first one is an electricity technology project carried out by the students and professors from energy a sustainability master program at Javeriana University with indigenous Wayu people at an education center in La Guajira, located in the north of Colombia. Lack of the electricity is one of the problems of this region, and other services related to educational development of indigenous children are affected. Most educational facilities do not have refrigeration systems, eco-sustainable waste management, and irrigation systems, making it impossible to have properly refrigerated food and medicine, which affects directly the environment where indigenous children study. Indigenous community, women, men, children, played an important role in both the design and implementation stage of this cross-disciplinary project. For instance, they work with Javeriana's students and professors in order to know the community context and needs, including past experiences, lessons learned, and current conditions. They also propose some alternatives to build a better solution to their needs and they have been involved during the implementation of the solution, creating groups that are involved in er energy efficiency, eco-toilets, solar system, business models, internet and communications, human organic waste management, care of the environment, and other related master matters. The second case comes from a dissertation written by a female student from the Rural Development Master at Javeriana University, whose research was about the feminization of rural work 
in a rice area in the Colombian Easter Plantains, Llanos Orientales Colombianos. Both women and men have been proponents and the use of the use of new technologies in rice planting. However, women, in addition to adopting the technology more easily, have been more constant in learning agronomic management, nutrition, and the inclusion of efficient implements that facilitate agricultural work. The production processes best adopted by women rice farmers are related to planting, variety selection, the preparation and adaptation of soils, the planting and the density of plants, nutrition and balanced cultivation, and phytosanitary management. Taking into account the integral and, inter and relational character of the rural territories, not just the agricultural production technology is relevant, but also other issues such, such as the agrarian structure and the land tenure. In the case reported so far, although women rice farmers are not the owners of the plots, they lease them, they have had access transformed and consolidate rural rice enterprises, and they are rooted in the land and rice crops. Family benefits from the rural work of women. They contribute economically to quality of life, housing, better nutrition, and education opportunities. These two examples illustrate very well the first aspect that I mentioned in the beginning. The, the diversity and interactions in rural communities. Diversity is a characteristic that should be a key element for technology transitional. My invitation always is, is to speak in plural. Rural territories, rural women, rural communities, technologies, and so on. The territorial approach to rural development and the new rurality approach pay special attention to the diversity of territorial actors, interculturality, and the gender perspective to the diversif diversification of livelihoods and product activities, to the dynamics and transformation of social ecological systems, and to territorial inequalities and inequities. Furthermore, this approach invite us to stop having a dichotomic vision between the urban and rural and to make more visible and enhance their growing and dynamic interactions and the complex relationships and connections between both spaces. Everything is interconnected, as Pope Francis insists us in Laudato Si. With this perspective, we must have a very grounded vision of territorial realities, understanding them not from a somewhat bucolic look that we often have of those, but from attitudes of dialogue, listening, and openness that allows to develop in a participatory way technologies based on the integral ecology that account for the diversities, singularities, and complexities. This means that it's not just important to see the technology itself as a final product, but also it is relevant to observe the process of creation, development, transfer, adaptation, and evaluation of technology as the energy project in La Guajira shows. Here, it's important to put attention on different gaps. The three of these gaps are between the needs and interests of territories and their people and the interests behind the technology, between the solutions offered by technology and the needs of rural people, between the technology solutions offered by enterprises and the sustainable access and decision-making of people of these technologies and territories. When I say territories, I am speaking about social ecological territories where people and nature interact in diverse and complex dynamics. In this sense, integral ecology applied to the territories understood in this way is about social ecological environmental justice. 
My second point, which is also present in the, in the two cases, is the fact that the technologies for rural territories are not free of many power inequalities. And even technology generates other forms of power. This means to take into account questions such as who takes the decisions and develops these technologies, whose needs are taken into account, who benefits from these technologies, how have been developed these technologies and for whom, how have been developed these technologies and for whom, how different people from diverse territories are taken into account in technology processes. All, oh, sorry. All these questions are related to power relationships. Power relationships commonly imply controlling power or power, or power over, but power relations can also have a positive side, side in the sense that they can create new possibilities and actions without domination, power to, or can imply good outcomes for a group which deals with problems together, power with, or can strengthen self-acceptance and self-respect which extend in turn to respect for and acceptance of others as equals, power from within. In this sense, power relations could imply not just conflicts, but also cooperative relationships. And these have implications not only for gender differences and equalities, but also for gender solidarities and complementarities. The empower approach emerged from the last three types of power. Empowerment means accessing now and the future to material, human and social resources, including technology and having well-being outcomes from this. But empowerment also implies that people have agency on these resources, this is people make decision and negotiate. In this sense, sorry, power not just achieved with affirmative action, but also with transformation action. Having access to certain technology for rural women, for instance, could be an important affirmative action for them. However, for this to become a real empowerment, which transform their lives in better lives, the process, the process must have social legitimacy to transform patriarchal discourses and practices about, for example, the place and role of women and men in the family, in the rural economy, and in rural society in general. In, general. in this sense, and to finish, I would like to leave another question. To what extent do technologies for rural territories empower rural people and especially rural women and help to transform patriarchal society? Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us that these crises of ecological systems are crises of, of exploitation mm -hmm. and the underlying power structures need to be challenged. Thank you for this. Um, these two inputs were a tall order. Um, I would now like to invite you, Carlo Maria Polvani, Undersecretary Adjunct of the Pontifical Council for Culture, to give us your remarks. And the audience, I would like to collect their questions already so that we may enter into a truly interdisciplinary debate after you have finished your input. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all the people who have uh, really worked at this great meeting. I've learned a lot so far. And I would like to pick up on uh, two things that have been said. I would like to pick up on CRISPR. I'd like to pick up on power. As we were preparing this, as you can imagine, this is not <laughs> rehearsed. But I don't have a PowerPoint, uh, because at the Pontifical Council of Culture, we believe in dialogue with believers and non-believers, and we do it in a straight way. So I'm sorry for scientists who tend to be precise, but I'll try to be precise. I think the question we're trying to answer is, we have a framework, we call it integral ecology, and then I speak for myself, being a biochemist, we have enormous advances in biochemistry. How do those two things fit together, if they can fit together? So the question is, 
you have biochemistry, which has made two giant leaps. Two giant leaps. I think we, we better put them down as an onset. The first one is CRISPR. The reason why CRISPR is so important is because we're down to one nucleotide. I mean, think of a book that you have to write, the book of life. Now we write the single letters. They're not perfect. It's going to take time to make it perfect. But we can write single letters, which means we can write any book we want, spaces included. When I started biochemistry, we had excision enzymes. We weren't even writing words. Right? We are down to single letters. The second one, which you have certainly heard about, is AlphaFold. One of the challenges in biochemistry is that it all boils down, for those of you who know biochemistry, to tertiary structure. It's the way the stupid thing just folds that makes it work. Right? And the problem was that we never knew how it did. But then, a couple of guys down at Google had a great idea. We're going to crunch the numbers like hell. I'm sorry to use that expression, but that's exactly what they did. And it turns out, it works. And it works both ways. I think what people don't realize with AlphaFold, which is amazing what they've done, is that you can tell the machine, I give you a sequence of DNA, you tell me what comes out. But you can also do it backwards. I give you what comes out, give me the sequence now. Now think just pharmaceutically what that means in terms of power. It means going very, very fast in developing you know, anything. Now, had this have been said, the question is, from these two, not the only ones, but these two main advances, can we predict somehow where this is going? Now, as think as scientists, we all have to be extremely humble for three reasons. One, we are all data-driven, and data changes. Two, many theories in science who everybody believed in, that we have forgotten by now, turned out to be wrong. Luminous ether, for instance, right? <laughs> so, and the third one is that we cannot go backwards. When we are scientists trying to predict the future, we're actually biting our own tail, if you think about it. We have data, we make a theory, we put an axiom, we go back to the data. Now, we don't have future data, that's the whole problem. So it's always a very dangerous approach. We still have to do it, but we have to be careful. I think we can come out with at least some points of reference which are certain. The first point of reference is that we have power like never before. It's interesting. I, I, I didn't notice until I came in here. It says, Sapienza potentia est from Francis Bacon, right? Yeah. Yes. And if I think if Sir Francis Bacon were here, he would say exactly this. We have never been so powerful as now. I'm not sure you used potency in the right word. And maybe I'm using maybe the word meant something different for him. But in any case, the point is that the reason why we can do so much good and so much evil at the same time is because we can do it and we cannot forget that. If we forget that, we're missing the point. The second point, I think, is that it goes back to another sentence from Francis Bacon. And this would be the, the I'll finish with this. There's a sentence from Bacon which is even truer today than it used to be when he pronounced it. In Latin it was, natura non nisi parendo vincitur. And vaguely translated, because again it's not clear what he meant, is nature cannot be won over if not obeyed. And this is the problem with integral ecology at the end. Are we to obey nature? Or can we make nature obey us? And I think the destiny of humanity is at stake precisely because of this. We are so powerful today, and you can see it in biochemistry, more than maybe in other, any other aspects, but not the only one, for sure. I mean, I've seen that they're moving very fast on fusion. It's not clear whether, how far they're going to go, but that the question is going to be exactly this. And if you think they're going to slow down, you're profoundly wrong. And let me give you just a very short example of something you have. You certainly heard of Elon Musk. 
You certainly have heard that he wants implants, and people are so afraid about the implants. And just last year, we were with Reid Hoffman. You might know Reid Hoffman, the, the guy who Napster and all these things, right? And he said, people are afraid of these things. And, uh, but if you leave home and you forget this, all of us will go back home and get it, right? If you forget your phone at home when you arrive at the office, you go back. So now it's just an extension of this, right? And think when the guy's going to tell you, well, don't worry. I'm just going to put it under your, your skin. You're going to be fine. I mean, robotics is already here. Transhumanism is already here. It's going to go very, very fast. And as far as biochemistry is concerned, it's going to go even faster. Even faster. So I'm not really convinced that, that we have much time, and I'm not convinced it's a bad thing. The only thing we are really sure of is that this is going to happen within our lifetime, and it's going to happen very quickly. In a way, I'm going back you know, to the problem of uh, global warming. It's going to happen. It's going to happen fast. When in chemistry, it's going to happen. It's going to happen fast. So time is running out. But I think I'll leave some time for discussion. It's better that way. All right. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Okay, uh, thanks, uh, especially also to, uh, to Kira, who made a wonderful uh, job. I know it's demanding uh, to follow all uh, the discussions, but you did it uh, very well. Thank you. Okay, uh, from, you know, we have a certain structure in the program, um, from foundations to implementation, and now even nearer to, um, to practice, presentations uh, and reflections on the um, natural scientific dimension of integral ecology. We, we start with a presentation or reflection of uh, Dr. Nancy Tuckman, um, who is a professor in the biology department at Loyola University Chicago. And she's dean, as far as I remember, funding, funding dean of the School of uh, Environmental Sustainability at this university. Please, uh, Nancy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So we are going to shift gears here into a big experiment that we're conducting at Loyola University Chicago, which is a brand new school of environmental sustainability that we've built to be transdisciplinary. And again, it is a big experiment. Um, we think it's working, but there are, there's going to be a lot of input that we can receive from this crowd that would be very helpful. So just first of all, for a, a context, our work is greatly guided by the Jesuit and Catholic leadership, both Laudato Si and the four universal op apostolic preferences of, of the Jesuits. And we actually work on all four of these preferences in the School of Environmental Sustainability. The way that we define environmental sustainability is a practice. It's a practice of natural resource stewardship that's designed to maintain the vitality of ecosystems so that nature can continue to support the needs of future generations. So it's very active. Um, it's in the head, but it's also in the heart and in the body. It's like you know, putting your whole uh, worldview into this context. At Loyola University Chicago, we're taking a two-pronged approach where we're greening our campus environmental footprint, and at the, time, at the same time, we're building a curriculum and building the school and sort of putting it into the basis of our education. So let me start by just describing very briefly what we're doing on our campus environmental footprint. We're trying to walk the walk so that we don't just teach about environmental sustainability, but we actively embrace it and work it on our campus. And we've been at this for 20 years, so we've made quite a bit of progress. We've been able to reduce our, reduce our energy consumption by 40% while at the same time growing the number of students in our student body and the number of faculty. 
We now have 100% renewable electricity on all four of our campuses in Chicago. You can see some of these milestones, and I'll just jump down to the bottom, that we do have a climate action plan that we built and got ratified by the Board of Trustees, and that requires that we become carbon neutral by the year 2025, and we're very, very close to being there. We're about 95% of the way there. We've won lots of different awards over the past 20 years. We consistently rank in the top 5% of green campuses in the United States. So even though some of this work at the level of the federal government has been completely stymied, we're working with cities and with individual local universities and faith-based organizations to really move environmental sustainability forward in our own context, in our own little <laughs> bubble, I, I suppose. Um, this attracts students. Forbes and the Amnesty International published a survey that they did with Generation Z um, and the survey was conducted in all countries around the world. And they asked these youth, what are the most important issues that are facing the world and facing your country? Number one, climate change. Number two, pollution. Number three, terrorism. And number four, loss of natural resources. So three of the four most urgent issues to the youth that are coming to our universities are about the environmental crisis. So we have to really take the responsibility and respond to this, I think both in action but also you know, in the way that we teach and what we're teaching them. So in building the School of Environmental Sustainability, we really believe that in order to address the world's complex, vexing, and urgent environmental problems, it requires building a transdisciplinary faculty and curriculum. So this is where the big experiment comes in. Um, we think about um, environmental science as being interdisciplinary. It has ecology, which of course is a subdiscipline of biology, at its center, so this is the study of nature, natural systems, their function and structure. But when you are working on environmental science, you have to bring all the human dimensions and layer it on top of that core of ecology. So this is environmental science, which again is interdisciplinary, but um, to use uh, Father um, Caruana's um, words, if you can fuse these together, then what emerges is a new discipline, and that's what um, one definition of transdisciplinary is, an emerging of a new discipline, which we would call sustainability science. And that's when all of the people that are in these different disciplines are working together on the same problem, coming to it from their own perspectives. And that's what we've built at this new school. We have 40 faculty that are coming from all of these different disciplines representing the discipline that they know, but their major interest is the environmental crisis. So bringing them all together to, to build um, a curriculum is really exciting because, I mean, it's risky, but it's exciting because you really get a, a lot of um, interesting developments and certainly the, the whole is much greater than the sum of the parts. The curriculum that we've built, um, the, the triangle that's green at the bottom is, are the foundational courses that all of our students, regardless of what major that they choose, to major in, they all have to take these courses that are in green. So you can see there's a good bit of science, but they also have to have economics, policy, there's a lot of experiential learning. They have to have, it's required that they take ethics and justice, um, and then also there are career courses. But, um, so all students are taking these courses, and then they, they kind of travel through these other areas which, which also make it interdisciplinary. They take um, electives from lists of courses that fall under those um, kind of yellow ovals, if you will. And that's what they're um, building on 
when they land in whatever major. So we've got six majors, and four of them are Bachelor of Science degrees. Those are the ones that are in the red font, and two of them are Bachelor of Arts degrees, and those are in the black font. So we, we have now over 500 students in our school. That about 400 of them are undergraduate students and 100 are master's students. We haven't yet built a PhD program, but they really find that these issues that we've selected as areas that we will have expertise in are very relevant you know, to their lives, and they want to be part of the solution. They want to be change agents in their lives and in their careers. So being able to give them this material in a very transdisciplinary way, I, I think is really um, exciting. The other thing that really attracts our students and also helps to keep them hopeful is um, when we allow them to make solutions on our own campus. They come up with ideas. We should be doing this, we should be doing that. Like why do we sell bottled water, for example, when we have perfectly good tap water um, from you know, Lake Michigan? We're right on Lake Michigan. It's a beautiful source of drinking water. So all of these things become part of a high impact learning modality that we utilize in the School of Environmental Sustainability to really help empower students. So they don't just learn about the grim reality of the data over and over, and they see how little hope there is. We, we empower them by, ha by working on big projects that really do reduce our own environmental footprint. I'm looking at the time here, and I just want to toggle through some of these. We do a lot of research on our green rooftops, and we, we talk about how... Um, not only does it conserve water, but it supports biodiversity. Um, we have a program called um, uh, Sustainable Agriculture. A lot of it is done in the urban setting. Students learn how to grow food, but that's not usually the career they go into. They're just learning the whole food system, the entire system and all of its inequities and inefficiencies. But they do aquaponics, which is a very um, efficient way of growing both fish and crops or plants in the same system that's very much recycled and requires very few inputs. So they, they learn how to do this. They've built their own farmer's market that's very close in a neighborhood right next to our campus where they sell the food that they produce. The money that they make goes back to supporting their program. Um, we have a kind of a unique biodiesel program, and this is where we take the waste vegetable oil from all of the deep fat fryers in our um, ca campus cafeterias. We collect it and then make it into biodiesel, which is a very simple esterification chemistry um, process. And then we use it in the shuttle buses that go between our campuses. So in this way, we're taking a waste product, which otherwise would go to the landfill. We're bringing it back on campus, making it into biodiesel, which reduces our input of fossil fuel-based diesel. So it's a circular economy, reducing our waste that goes out from the campus, reducing our consumption coming into the campus, and reducing both of those and doing a better job of using and reusing materials is really a big focus of what we do um, in this education. And, and just by the way, glycerin is a byproduct of making biodiesel out of waste vegetable oil, and we now make soap out of the glycerin. And the soap is distributed in every bathroom and restroom in, on all of our campuses. And so the students are making the soap. We no longer buy soap from externally, and they're making it from a waste product. We also have a small field station where they really do learn about nature while they're in nature. And this is important for such an urban campus as Loyola Chicago. And then finally, I know you can't see this, but I wanted you to see that 92% of our undergraduate students who graduate are now change agents in environmental careers. So they're getting jobs. And this is important to the parents. Again, the parents want to know, what am, what's my kid going to do if they get a degree with you? But they're getting jobs in lots of different sectors 
analytical laboratories, businesses, consulting, um, environmental private sector, government sector, et cetera. So that's where I'm gonna end, I'm a little bit late. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dick Nancy, for these uh, wonderful uh, insights. Now, uh, it's time for an experiment uh, that is uh, the first uh, online uh, contribution. We try to connect with Rodrigo Rodriguez Tornquist from uh, Argentina. Rodrigo? Uh, Hello. Uh, Rodrigo, ecco. Hello. Can you, you hear us? Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. Fine. Rodrigo uh, is, well, I don't know where he is at the moment. He's uh, traveling uh, around the world. Uh, we were in contact. However, he is uh, under Secretary of Knowledge for Development at the Secretariat of Strategic Affairs of Argentina and very engaged uh, with uh, sustainability. He's former State Secretary of Climate Change, Sustainable Development and Innovation. Unfortunately, um, he cannot uh, be with us because he is traveling traveling for the climate. I know it's a little bit uh, co uh, contradictory, please excuse, but he is a fighter for the climate, let's say, uh, a fighter for his country, um, but also for the climate in general. Um, Rodrigo, wh wh where are you uh, traveling to um, today or tomorrow? Uh, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm traveling in a couple hours to the America Summit alongside with the, with the presidential uh, uh, entourage. So uh, I, I have to leave in, in maybe in two to three hours. Okay, I hope your presentation will not last that long. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, okay. Uh, however, it's uh, um, beautiful that you um, share your um, time with us. You, um, Thank you. You took part in uh, many uh, climate uh, neg negotiations, um, as far as I know. and. Um, we are thankful that you want to um, share your experiences uh, with us and maybe bring in some meaningful thoughts. So the floor is yours. Uh, and we at the Aula Magna at Rome are listening to you carefully. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to thank the, the Pontifical Gregorian University and the organizers for having me uh, today. And I also would like to, to thank the distinguished uh, panelists that I'm, I'm sharing this this space. Uh, it is an honor for me to, to share this panel with you. Thank you. Let me uh, share some thoughts with you. Um, I understand that the only certainty we have for the future is that we will need to, to deal with high uncertainty. We live in times of deep transformations and changes in every single order. I think that hope, dialogue, and innovation are useful, useful approaches for addressing the times to come. The new hope requires to recognize the complexity and collective nature of the threats we face and promote a new dialogue for organizing ourselves more effectively to address them. Geopolitical tensions, environmental degradation, social inequality, global recession and inflation, financial instability added to the disruptive impacts of the pandemic are a new reality that we need to understand in order to be addressed. Challenges are arising. But there is one that threatens all our progress and multiplies all the risks, the climate crisis. Unless we act now, we have clear evidence that we will, have, we will not have a livable planet in the near future. The amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere broke a record last May, reaching 421 parts per million. There is more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now than at any time in the last 4 million years. According to the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, last week in the Stockholm Plus 50 conference, there is a 50-50 chance that we could temporarily breach the Paris Agreement limit of 1.5 degrees Celsius in the next five years. We cannot let it happen. We must cut greenhouse gas emissions by 45% by 2030 to reach net zero by 2050. The scientific evidence is clear and the reality is giving us shocking facts about the destructive force of our mother earth. However, the political response has been weak and late so far. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was adopted 30 years ago in 1992. Since then, 
we have witnessed commitments and pledges that have not been fully honored. While developed countries accepted the Convention's principle of equity and thus the responsibility to lead climate action, their performance has, their performance has been disappointing. Financial pledges and emission reduction targets voluntarily established by the developed nations were not achieved. The last COP26 had the objective of discussing the operational details of the Paris Agreement in order to trigger the implementation of climate action. The UK's presidency established an important set of goals to be discussed and agreed. Uh, and agreed. First, to keep 1 on 5 alive, increasing ambition and committing carbon neutrality by 2050 by every single country on, on Earth. Second, strengthening the adaptation agenda, establishing common goals and mechanisms for assisting vulnerable countries and communities. Third, loss and damage mechanism to assist those countries affected by climate catastrophes. <coughs> Sorry. Four, mobilizing financial support, enabling the allocation of financial flows for climate action in a consistent manner with sustainable development, as stated in Article 21C of the Paris Agreement. Five, rules for Article 6 to establish cooperative mechanisms through market and non-market approaches. Six, transparent, transparency and common timeframes. Six, seven, gender, agriculture, citizen empowerment, among other important issues. Sincerely, the results have been disappointing, outdated and insufficient to the narrow window of opportunity we have. We couldn't reach any concrete agreement on, fin on financial mobilization, nor a substantive decision for phasing out coal plants. A few advances in some issues and several political pledges on methane abatement, deforestation reduction, electromobility, and some other issues showed a weak outcome compared to the imperative and urgency of climate change. Next November at COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt, we will have a chance to continue conversation on these important issues. At the same time, in other fora, Advanced negotiations on biodiversity, pollution, resource scarcity, and other environmental, social, and economic distresses show that we need to act now. We must address these threats in parallel because the science is clear on how they interact. Global warming and a degraded biosphere are leading to major shifts in animal lives, bringing recurring pandemics. We must confront the risk of growing divergences within and especially across countries. Higher prices of basic foods, livestock feed, fertilizers and energy are taking the biggest toll on poorer countries, which are the most vulnerable to extreme weather events. Governments of developing countries have little fiscal capacity to manage these shocks. More than 70 countries are already in or near debt distress. Faced with immediate constraints, we risk continued neglect of education and healthcare improvements with dangerous longer term and global consequences. We must bridge growing divides and rewire multilateralism to serve both collective and national interests more effectively. We must bring preparedness for new and known threats into the mainstream of public policy and collective thinking. For addressing this new reality, we need a systemic approach. These issues need to be discussed in an integrated and a balanced manner, based on the understanding that no one is safe alone. Managing the decarbonization process and the ecological transition in an orderly and organized fashion that does not significantly disrupt the economy or affect people's lives is critically important as we race to respond to increasingly catastrophic impacts. The basic principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respected capabilities should be respected and climate action must be addressed in a just transition. A key pillar of the discussion is about finance. The $100 billion annual funding pledge made by developing countries in Copenhagen in 2009 is still far from becoming a reality. However, the costs of climate action have skyrocketed. According to the IMF, the world will need to invest an estimated 100 to 150 trillion over the next 30 years to achieve net zero carbon emissions. We need to triple investments in renewables to at least 4 trillion a year. We already know what to do. We need to improve energy efficiency rapidly and vastly, 
reduce deforestation, restore coastal ecosystem, and triple investment in, in nature-based solutions. It's time for a constructive discussion to establish the enabling conditions for action. To move forward concretely, we need to think about innovative financial mechanisms for a new development model that integrates environmental considerations into the economy. Let me share, share with you some ideas. In terms of financing, it is important to establish a balance between mitigation and adaptation actions, as well as consider financing actions, capacity building, and technology transfer and development. We can also consider alternative metrics to GDP that integrates environmental issues. A solidarity, a solidarity pact that allows channeling special drawing rights to developing countries, extending terms and reducing rates could be possible. We can also think about debt swaps for climate action, payments for ecosystem services, incorporating the concept of environmental debt and a category for environmental creditors. Rethinking credit ratings so as not to punish vulnerable countries that are the ones that suffer the most from the impacts of climate change. Incentives for private investment in environmental and social issues, such as in circular economy. And ensuring financial assistance to countries that commit to climate change and debt relief so that our goals are, our climate goals are met. We need to redefine our development model. The ecological transition requires a paradigm shift in our civilizational culture. We cannot address the challenges of this new era without a more effective, strengthened, networked multilateralism based on trust and global cooperation. We are all collectively responsible of a reality that no one desires individually. We have a unique opportunity to change the path, to promote an integral and sustainable human development. Throughout history, humanity has shown that we are capable of great things if we work together. The Laudato Si encyclical set a clear roadmap on how to promote integral ecology. Let us respond to the urgent appeal for a new dialogue about how we are shaping the future of our planet, planet and promote a dialogue which includes everyone. As Pope Francis states, God always forgives. We men forgive sometimes but nature never forgives. Thank you so much. There's a uh, pretty loud uh, applause uh, here in the aula for you, uh, Rodrigo. So <laughs> thank you very much. And do you have a time to, to stay for the debate round or? Uh, okay, thank you. So uh, two other short presentations and then, so we can give uh, questions also to you. Perfect, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, now it's uh, uh, time for Timothy Holes. To my uh, left, he's Assistant Director in Research Programming at the Laurel de Sea Research Institute at the Campion Hall University of Oxford, and is uh, currently involved with a project at uh, this institute investigating attitudes to gene drive technologies in South American countries. So, I'm pretty curious uh, what you uh, brought for us. Uh, it's a delicate topic. Uh, you are a theologian. Um, and yeah, let's see uh, what, how, you, um, how you discuss uh, this topic. Please, uh, Timothy, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Christian, and thank you all of you for receiving me this evening. I wonder if I can begin with this image Cochlea hominivorax, the new world screwworm. This parasitic fly present throughout the new world tropics is known for the way in which its larv larvae, the maggots, eat the living tissue of warm-blooded animals. It represents a threat to livestock, causing excruciating pain and almost always death. That means it threatens as well systems of agricultural production. Damage to the Latin American region alone is estimated at $4 billion per year. And there are effects on public health too. The infestation of the human body by this fly can cause chronic infected wounds, blindness, and sometimes even death. 
Screwworm infestations have so far been tackled in the Central American region, in the Central American region, through material barriers, through spraying, and even through the introduction of sterile breeders. And those techniques have been effective to a large degree, but they have not yet been pushed down into the Latin American region where infestations continue to be a significant problem. Now, however, a new technology appears on the horizon. Gene drives generated through CRISPR-Cas technology is a method to facilitate the biased inheritance of particular genes throughout an entire insect species. It does this by genetically modifying some members who, it is hoped, will pass on that phenotypical trait through their, to their offspring. Now, two very quick points about this technology before we go on. First, gene drive technology is conceptually and biologically novel compared to previous techniques because by contrast with previous techniques, which will be uh, uh, selectively bred out where the adaptive advantage is missing, gene drives push through a trait that humans choose is desirable for them. In this case, uh, non-breeding. Secondly, it's likely that gene drive technology, if it was applied to this region, would be entirely successful in eradicating screwworm infestations in some estimates in one year only. So what state are we in with this technology now? Gene drives have been under development for many years in particularly American laboratories. They are essentially ready for rollout. However, that has largely or entirely not yet taken place due to ongoing considerations uh, and debates about the status of this technology at an international regulatory level. So a very brief summary. We have here a potentially decisive intervention for an issue pertaining to animal and human health. And by the way, I haven't even mentioned yet mosquitoes carrying malaria which would have an exponentially greater effect on all the issues I've outlined. Second, we find ourselves at a crucial moment for the potential rollout of this technology. And third, scientists and policymakers are right now debating the ethics of this technology. I'd like to do two things in the few minutes remaining. First, I'm going to suggest that some of these debates currently in play in the international arena are a little bit stuck at the moment. They're struggling to evaluate, analyze, and respond to the novel ethical issues raised by this technology. That's the first point. And second, I'm going to therefore conclude that there's good reason for other groups, including the Catholic Church, to get involved, to provide insights that can deepen that analysis and produce better policy making. So what is taking place at the international level? There is a lot, but the main forum, I would say, is in the Convention on Biological Diversity and some of its associated protocols. At one level, the rhetoric and discussion going on here is very, very positive. Here is one key statement suggesting that each contracting party to the convention um, must establish or maintain means to regulate, manage, or control the risks associated with the use and release of living modified organisms resulting from biotechnology that are likely to have adverse environmental effects. That sounds positive to me, but let me mention three things where this discussion might be a little bit stuck at the moment. Number one, all this international policy and regulation can sometimes be reactive to public pressure. 
Work on gene drives takes place amongst small groups of experts, but they're often responding, at least the nation states that drive the decision making, to public pressure. And you may have seen yourself, there have been a number of high profile articles, including public campaigns for moratoria on the development of gene drives. As you can imagine, ethical consideration is not usually done well when it is reactive to social media, especially where that may struggle to be informed about the complexity of the issue. So we have a need for other voices to be involved. Example number two, governments and policymakers sometimes struggle to define issues of representation and consent. The convention has largely enshrined the principle of free, prior and informed consent as a condition for the release of gene drives into the wild. That is extremely positive and is a result of awareness of indigenous and local community issues. But it does raise questions. The threshold is set very high, often requiring up to 80% community consent before anything would begin. What does that process look like in communities where democratic and discursive processes might be very different from what we anticipate? We bump into important social and cultural differences, some of which are aligned with religious or other cultural assumptions that are not easy to navigate by, let's say, American scientists. The policy-making environment is also reactive to that, and here as well, the church and other groups can intervene. Final example, political circumstances can sometimes intervene to disrupt the expert work going on in these environments. As you know, we were supposed to have had a full conference at Kunming in China. That has been disrupted in various ways by the pandemic. And as things stand, there are still policy-making fora to take place later this year. One of the expert groups on this issue recently submitted a report that was more bracketed than full text. This reflects some of the confusion over the ethical stance being taken. And it's even been claimed that some of the work has been stalled under Chinese chairing of this convention uh, due to complex terminological issues and other policy interests, even in laboratories in Wuhan. Here again, it's important that we have a multiplicity of non-state voices intervening to uh, embellish a process that can sometimes be disrupted by politics. So let me conclude. In some way, I am grateful for the international policy environment just described. In some ways, its slowness is exactly the right thing to have. It's better that a precautionary approach is taken than rushing forward into this very complex ethical arena. But I think there's a place for other social, cultural, and religious groups to provide insights, to raise some of the questions shown here on this slide. And in doing so, I think can contribute to deeper analysis of the issues that can sometimes be missed or overdetermined in the international regulatory environment. So I'm glad that we, as one example of such a group, are gathering here today. And I believe that Catholic understandings, amongst others, have a vital role to play in producing this constructive and forward-directed ethical discussion. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, at least regarding time uh, keeping, and um, I thank you for the for the insights. Um, it's, I mean, the technology of, of gene technology of gene drive is uh, not so common to all of us. Uh, I think some more, other less, and. Um, Thank you for this um, discussion of the pros and the cons. And um, yeah, let's see if uh, we have questions afterwards. But thank you for the moment.
Okay, um, last uh, contribution uh, in uh, this best practice session, and afterwards uh, we have the um, the um, closing note of uh, Ernst Oli von Weizsäcker. But now uh, we have uh, Amy Wulem Echevaria. Echevaria, uh, maybe you can um, tell how it is pronounced correctly. Sorry for this. Um, she joins us uh, via Zoom and she currently serves as International Justice, Peace and Integrity of Creation co Coordinator for um, Columban uh, Missionaries and as Co-Coordinator of the Ecology Task Force of the Vatican COVID-19 Commission. So thank you also to you, uh, Amy, for um, joining us. And yeah, um, you, are talk you will talk about uh, Biodiversity negotiations, uh, if I remember right. Thank you so much, Christian. It's I'm really humbled to be here among so many distinguished scholars and practitioners. It's really nice to be able to be with you from my home in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is also home to Rachel Carson. I was invited to speak about uh, my experience with the ongoing biodiversity COP15 negotiations and integral ecology, but I'd like to share with you a brief personal story from my childhood. While growing up on visits to my extended family in the Northeast part of the United States, we would drive along a heavily wooded and shadowy road called Wissahickon Drive and through the hilly neighborhoods of Conshohocken, Maniunk, and Passiunk of Philadelphia. These names and places stirred quiet curiosity and a feeling of communion inside of me. My child's mind knew that these names and places told a deep story of another time and people I did not know. I would later learn that in the language spoken by the First Nations Lenape, Wissahickon means land of the turtles, Passiunk means valley, Maniunk means river, and Conshohocken means large bowl ground place, which indicates the bend in the Turtle River. These hills, valleys, and riverbanks were among the first places I felt a longing to be in relationship with people and non-human life alike, to understand cultures, languages, and habitats unlike my own. I tell you this story because these are the people and places imprinted on my heart that I go back to again and again, especially when attending meetings like the UN COP15 negotiations. Drawing on decades of commitment to care for creation, including following UN processes, Columbans became accredited to the CBD COP process. We observed that unlike in the climate change space, the faith voice was much dimmer in relation to biodiversity. We have been attending virtual and in-person meetings, including the recent negotiations in Geneva, and we will continue to participate throughout the process and beyond. At these negotiations, we submitted in writing and orally our policy recommendations based on our missionary experience that emphasizes listening to human and non-human voices that call for healing, justice, and nonviolence in all of our relationships. We also co-founded and continue to work with an international multi-faith working group, which has similar, similarly submitted policy recommendations. Through the Vatican COVID Commission Ecology Task Force and the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development, we've been in close dialogue with the Holy See's Secretary of State about its participation in the negotiations. We work with many partners, many of you in the room there, for community engagement and education. 
During the March negotiations in Geneva, some of the major points of debate included greater inclusion of language ensuring human rights, especially of indigenous people, local communities, women and youth, the inclusion or not of numerical targets, such as 30%, 50% of land protection not already managed by indigenous peoples, or even 100% protection against any biodiversity loss. Concepts such as ecosystem services and nature-based solutions were vigorously debated. Dig digital sequencing information and benefit sharing, which parties are quite divided on, was uh, deeply discussed and further negotiations will be needed. Financing, resource mobilization, and implementation mechanisms still need to be addressed. As with the climate change negotiations, there is debate over who is responsible to pay for the implementation of targets, including the role of businesses. Much of the text negotiation in Geneva remains uncertain and lacks a truly integral vision. This is a vision we can and need to bring. It will be easy to weaken the framework in the next round of negotiations in Nairobi. Binding commitments are needed for accountability and proper funding in order for countries to truly reverse biological collapse. Also needed is further integration of the CBD with other UN processes like the UNFCCC, the UN Oceans Conference, and others. When I read for the first time the important report by the Laudato Si Research Institute published in 2021, The Wailing of God's Creatures, a report on the current biodiversity crisis, I felt very encouraged. The report makes a clear call for the church to engage in local, national, and international advocacy alongside our theological, scientific, social, educational, and pastoral work, which is essential for an integral ecological approach and vision. I'd like to amplify that call to follow the same impulse we've acted on as a church for climate change and respond to that same call for biodiversity. It was shocking to me that in the recent Geneva meetings, there were only two people out of hundreds who were there representing the Catholic perspective and not including indigenous spiritualities, only two other people were representing other faiths. We also need to be involved in things like UN Universal Periodic Reviews and monitoring of the national strategic action plans once the COP15 concludes. I'd like to conclude by recognizing that the road to Kunming began for me on Wissahickon Drive in Philadelphia. We all have such roads. Trees and rivers and all creation have their journeys too. Pope Francis often talks about the importance of memory, of drawing on the deep wells of our lives to give meaning to today. Going to the deep wells is both symbolic and real. If we continue to allow further mass, mass biodiversity destruction, we lose those memories and future generations of all life will not be able to create new ones. Yesterday, we celebrated World Environment Day and the Feast of Pentecost. Perhaps unlike any other feast in our liturgical calendar, let us imagine that it is the Feast of Biodiversity. It is the feast in which the whole of creation is in the hammock of God's love in a new way. I love that from our previous speaker. Let this Pentecost be truly a time of renewing the face of the world. Many thanks for your kind and patient attention. Okay. So, um, last but not least, uh, the evening finishes with an highlight after many other highlights already. 
That is uh, with a contribution by Professor Ernst Olli von Weizsäcker. He's uh, since decades a pioneer and front runner for sustainability, and this on, on world level, let's say. He was inter alia co chair of the International Resource Panel of the United Nations Environmental Program and co president of the Club of Rome. And he wrote a book, Come On, where he advocates for an Enlight Enlightenment uh, 2.0. That is a certain view of the world. One of the sentences I like most in this book is, it could be wise to listen to the spiritual and religious dimensions of all civilizations in certain regards. His today's note is entitled Enlightenment 2.0 and Integral Ecology. Dear Ernst, it's a pleasure and a great honor to have you here at Rome today. Thank you very much, Richard. And as you know, the written, the printed schedule says it's now drinks. So as much as I can shorten my presentation, you will be happy. Anyway, talking about the Enlightenment. Herman Daly, who used to be the chief economist of the World Bank, not exactly an uh, environmental lunatic, said, we better distinguish between the empty world earlier and the full world today. The trouble is that for animals, it's the opposite way, you know. The full world was wonderful, and the empty world is a disaster. But uh, here it says, for the environment today, the empty world was fine, was great, sustainable, and the full world is not. So, it's a difficult situation, you know. Well, the old enlightenment evidently took place during the empty world, no doubt about that. One of the most disastrous products of the old enlightenment came from Herbert Spencer, who proposed social Darwinism. He said the state should not support the weak ones, evolution would eliminate them, thereby solving the problem of weakness. You know, and I, spent six years of my life in America and got the impression that all Americans believe that social Darwinism is, an, uh, nature of, uh, is a law of nature. We, we cannot change it. This I find brutal. Okay, addressing some of the problems of the old Enlightenment, the Club of Rome wrote uh, uh, the book I mean, there were 40 authors. I was only the chief editor. And um, it has three parts. Part one, come on, don't tell me the current trends are sustainable. They are not. Part two, come on, don't stick to outdated philosophies, meaning essentially the old enlightenment. And part three, come on, join us on an exciting journey towards a sustainable world. I mean, the English language allows two different meanings of, of come on. On part one, essentially you could say, <laughs> the last 70 years were the years of explosive, dangerously destructive acceleration. This is the challenge of today and of the new um, enlightenment. One paradigm for the full world are the body weights of land living vertebrates. Two thirds uh, of the weights are our domesticated animals, essentially for slaughter, as you know. 30% of the weight, body weights, is we leaving a minor 3% for all wild animals. 
This is not exactly what people like Descartes or Immanuel Kant or so have been thinking of. And then we heard uh, about Johann Rockström uh, this um, early afternoon. Um, currently, some parts of our changing the environment are outside the safe operating space. In a world of continued growth of the gross domestic product, we must realize that growth goes systematically with CO2 emissions in the eight relevant sectors of our economy. I'm afraid this is a very unfortunate message. It means further economic growth means climate collapse. On the other hand, all countries of the world want further growth. So by this earlier sentence you mean all countries of the world want climate collapse. Unless we manage to decouple growth from damaging climate. It's quite a large, quite a heavy, um, well, thing to do. In common, we say that our civilizations are in a deep philosophical, philosophical crisis. And of course, most of us have read Pope Francis' encyclical Laudato Si, where he declares, it's one of the 200 uh, statements, that the current economy of greed, relentless competition, and wild acceleration is destroying our common home. Responding to that philosophical crisis, we suggest to engage in a new enlightenment. And a new book, which is so far only in German, I'm digging a bit deeper into the need for a new enlightenment. But let me first uh, uh, come back to the questions of uh, today's problems regarding global warming. What can we do? Well, of course, uh, build coastal dams. Because the rise of the seawater table, as we also heard today, can be absolutely catastrophic for all the areas directly at the, um, at the coast. Stop coal burning. Yes, of course, we know in Germany, even worse in Poland or uh, Russia or India or Colombia or um, South Africa, they love, uh, well, profits from coal. So it's not exactly popular. Nor is more modest lifestyles. It's also not very um, popular. But expanding solar power is really very, very good for this discoupling activity. Or the efficiency revolution. It's really doable and helpful for the decoupling. The solar uh, photovoltaics has become absolutely affordable. When I was member of parliament, we started the renewable energies law, and at that time, 20 years ago, the price of a kilowatt hour of photovoltaics was roughly one euro. And nowadays, in North Africa, it is one euro cent. So a factor of 100 less. Isn't that amazing? I think I find that an extremely encouraging finding. And then, 
on uh, resource productivity. I wrote the book with an Ameri uh, with an Australian team called Factor Five, and the Chinese, when reading the Chinese translation, said, "Oh, this is exactly our philosophy. We need to fivefold or twentyfold increase resource productivity. This is what we need in order to." Um, well, keep the world uh, convenient and beautiful. Um, I have forgotten one slide. It shows Mount Everest, and it shows a bucket of water 10 kilograms heavy. And I always ask my students, I did so in California, now I do it in Germany, asking them, how many kilowatt hours would you need to lift that bucket of water to the top of Mount Everest? And the typical answer I'm getting is 1,000 kilowatt hours. Or uh, in California, it was rather 10,000. Completely wrong. The physical answer is one quarter of a kilowatt hour meaning that the kilowatt hour is a fantastic powerhouse with which you can do a lot. But we waste in no end because it doesn't cost a thing. That's the trouble. So we have to politically manage profitability for the right things, not for the wrong things, like coal burning. So let's switch then to the environment, uh, the Laudato Si and the... Uh, New Enlightenment. Balance is the virtue of justice, as you know. And, in our view, stands for the core of the New Enlightenment, such as between heart and brain. But in Western cultures, and in particular in the peers for the peer review publications, it is dogma, mathematics, and all that. Well, in Asian cultures, balance symbolizes wisdom and wholeness, the yin yang symbol. In sub Sahara Africa, the good philosophy is called Ubuntu. Essentially, it means I am because we are as a community, or I am how my neighbors see me, which is different from this dogmatism. And then we need a number of um, examples for good balance between humans and nature. I mean, what I was saying about the vertebrates is not exactly in balance, you know? It's the opposite. Um, or balance between short-term and long-term. You know, if you are hungry, you better eat now than 30 years from now. But... If you talk about climate and uh, biodiversity, you better think in terms of 30 years or more. So this has to be balanced and brought together. Or balance between markets and the state. Today's um, the dog dogmatic economists say, well, markets are always better than the state. They are full of imagination of what you can do. While the state is always bringing it back to something. So this is the usual mentality I also have been experiencing in America. But if we have a good balance, we have also controls over wrong markets. I mean, Adam Smith, the inventor of the idea of the invisible hand, and of the markets for that matter, at his time knew that the geographical reach of the market is identical with the geographical re of, uh, reach of the law. And then markets are under the law. But today, Markets are global, and the law is essentially national or provincial. So markets are winning over the law, which is crazy. 
But um, a government without markets, like the old communism, is also crazy. Okay. Balance between state and religion. Of course, you need a constitution for your country. That's great. And also, you need the religions. I believe nobody in this uh, room wants the Islamic State. But nobody in this room will ha uh, would accept a state forbidding religions. You know? So it is very important to find a good balance, or balance between economic equity and incentives for achievement. That's a typical quarrel between the left-hand side in politics and the right-hand side. The left-hand side, we, uh, everything has to be justice, and the right-hand side said, yeah, but there is nothing f for distribution available unless you have a strong incentive for achievement. Or balance between innovation and customary tradition. You know, uh, innovation is a great thing. In America, they t uh, typically call it dis um, disruptive. Dis disruptive technology, that's the best now. But this is also destructive. The authors of uh, disrup uh, disruptive technologies explicitly quote uh, Schumpeter with his destructive uh, innovation. Okay, on the other hand, uh, we also need the experience, including of earlier generations. Okay, at business school, you still learn that the fastest will be the winner. And for, but for culture and civilization and religion, this is stupid. And for nature, it's a disaster. Those were six of a hundred proposals for good balance. I hope this will help thinking about an integral ecology. Thank you.